Ladies and gentlemen, here we are on the My Family Thinks I'm Crazy podcast, and with me today are two gentlemen who I'm excited to talk to. It's a little overdue, and uh, if you haven't heard of them already, I think you're going to be a new subscriber. Uh, Cryptids of the Corn is joining us here. That is Justin and Jay, and uh, yeah, thanks for joining me, guys. Before we get into our discussion about... uh, all sorts of strange stuff. Give us a little background on how your show came together and, and who, who the two of you are. I'll do the two of us if you do the background. All right. So yep, I'm Justin. That's Jay. I'm Jay. Yes. Uh, Crips of Corn podcast, like you said, on all the podcast platforms, we have a lot of fun. We like to say we're science and magical things combined. Um, so I was a fisheries biologist. I did a lot of that stuff. I worked with endangered species, habitat surveys, eDNA, which is a big topic in the cryptid field right now. And, you know, it's all that fun stuff. Uh, and then Jay is definitely the more conspiratorial side of the podcast. He brings that balance. He has a, me and him do not think the same, but we have so much fun talking about this stuff. Cause a lot of times by the end of one of our episodes, I think even though we have very different thought patterns, a lot of times we do kind of end up thinking the same thing by the end. Yeah. The ongoing joke right now on our show is at the very end of our episodes, if it's a cryptid or encounter topic or whatever, I normally give a list of possibilities of what it could be. And I save what I think what it is for the very last one 99% of the time. Yeah, probably. Jay's got this habit of guessing it by like 20 minutes in. And ruining it. And ruining it. Ruining the big reveal, ruining the surprise. But that means I'm doing a good job of presenting the information, at least in my head, because there's enough connection then between all the evidence to suggest what I thought. That's pretty, yeah. I'd say so. That's pretty accurate. So that's who we are, and you know, at least the show and stuff like that. But why don't you take over the background and kind yeah. of how we got this ball rolling? Well, um, so I was a, well, still am a bartender at, at, at the local bowling alley, and that's where I met. You know, this guy. I am an alcoholic, so well, that, Matt, that, that, that tracks. That's where the connection came. So uh, after serving him over the years, he... He brought me liquor tonight. Well, that's true. Um, he uh, approached me, or called me over, he didn't approach me, and said, do you believe in Bigfoot? Very aggressively and very drunken. Yes. And, you know, and of course, you know, I'm not going to say no, because I'm, I do. Big believer over here. Although I've never seen or experienced anything, but I believed. So we started a, um, our Hardin County Bigfoot Society group where we were going to, us and like-minded fellows of the town, we're going to gather and um, discuss things like Bigfoot. And If I may add, Hardin County, Ohio has a tiny population in Northwest Ohio. Okay. Oh, yeah, it's very small. I just wanted to. Very small rural town we're from. I've we driven through Ohio a couple times. Oh, yeah. We're the flat part. Okay. Yeah, we're the part one of the parts you keep driving through. Okay. <laughs> um, so when we started that group, you know, we were expecting some pretty good numbers. It was off to a slow stars, just me and you and Emily, your wife, mm-hmm. and then two others. I think we had maybe three, and then it got well, it never got bigger, and it just got smaller, and then it was just me and you sitting around once a month talking about Bigfoot, and then, so Justin says. Why don't we just start a podcast and record it? Because I was doing a lot of work, research, presenting data and all this fun stuff. And oh, which I was happy to do. But it was like, I don't know why we're making a big deal of going someplace to do this when we just do this at the house. We just wanted to talk about Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of how it went. But uh, me and Jay's grandpas were very, very close friends. And then our moms are, are 
very close friends. Yeah. So just kind of weird. The only reason me and Jay really didn't start hanging out until we started doing this stuff is our age gap. Uh, he's, what are you, five years older than me? Depends how old you are. I'm 28 now. Oh, so yes. So we were never in, we were never in high school together. Like he was out when I was coming in, that kind of deal. So we always knew about each other, but we just never had that time of really in any school situation. Oh, never. Yeah, never did. But yeah, that's kind of how the bones got to it. We had the picture of our Bigfoot standing in a cornfield way before we had the name. And, you know, children of the corn, uh, cryptids of the corn, because there's a lot of stuff happens up here in the corn belt. Yeah. And yeah, you walk out of, well, at least out of my house, you look straight forward out of your front door. It's corn. You look right. It's corn. Left. It's corn. Oh, yeah. Like, uh, our buddy Lyle Blackburn, he was saying on stage, uh, you know, corn's scary. It may not look like it from the road. You walk out there, you might as well be in the middle of a forest. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, and, and yeah, absolutely. I can relate somewhat, although I grew up in a suburban area on Long Island Sound. Uh, now where I live is in a rural area. And uh, so I've been I've been around a few cornfields, and I've also driven through the the real cornfields, the massive cornfields, mm-hmm. and it's intimidating. But yeah, people don't often think of plants as having like a shared consciousness or a shared being. But if you think about it, all those corn plants, they're all rooted in the ground. They're all kind of one organism. You know, I think, what is it, the largest organism in the world is up in Utah, and it's like a, a type of birch tree that shares all the same roots, right? And it's just this massive state park, and it's technically all one organism. I wonder if uh, corn as a monocrop, you know, and maybe obviously with human agricultural techniques, maybe we've imbued a little bit of magic into the corn, and the corn's kind of opened up some kind of portal in return. I like it. Uh, no wonder why your family thinks you're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you can't believe you took the joke so early in the show. Oh, did I? Yeah. Ten minutes uh, in, that's all right. <laughs> uh, oh, so, so soon. No, uh, we've talked about uh, plant consciousness, and so right now... Uh, that I do think there's they're very different than us, but I do think there's something there. It's hard to talk about. Uh, we we did a whole ep- uh, several episodes now on fungal intelligence. So fungus aren't animals or plants; they're their own much more ancient thing, and they do pass cognitive tests, but they're just the level of cognitivity is very different and hard to judge coming from a human standpoint. That they probably don't have this thought of self like we do. Mm. You know, it's they're one thing, like you were just saying. It's all one thing, even though there's many individual corn plants or many individual whatever. Um, so the birch forest, there's one thing that's bigger. There's actually two. So there's Bob that is a mushroom out in Oregon, right? Oregon. He is an entire state forest. He's a honey mushroom. He's fully integrated into the flora on his back and some of the fauna on his back. Uh, if you squared him up, he's about 2,200 square acres. Uh, he's an entire national forest. Uh, he's one organism. They found out about him because same with the birch forest. They cut down to do a soil sample, and 100 acres of trees died the next day. Wow. So we used to think fungus would – so fungus can integrate into the root networks with their mycelia and hyph- hyphae. They can integrate, and in, we used to think it was more mutual. That It was this trading back and forth. Like they were the guys that were kind of brokering trade deals with other plants and animals. We now know it's much more controlled by the fungus and how some of the stuff we figured out about that is Bob would kill sections of forest on his back to re the soils through grasslands. And it, you would, if you watched it through geology, it kind of looks like a clock. So it's 1 o'clock's turn, now it's 2 o'clock's turn, 3 o'clock's turn, and he would go through. And now there's an even bigger thing than Bob that was just discovered last year, 2023. Oh, wow. Uh, we just talked about it. What was it? In the sea cow episode. I'm setting you up. Oh, uh, a seagrass meadow is one plant. Uh, the new, new seagrass meadow is in the middle of the Atlantic. He is 212 miles wide. Wow. And uh, I call him he or whatever, just how they, they named it a boy's name. Now I can't remember it. Steven. But they just found this <laughs> seagrass meadow because of one shark. They never knew about it. There's these whole masses. So you think uh, for all these people, all of our listeners here in the U.S. or around, you know, 212 miles is about as tall as Ohio. Not as wide, but about as tall. So you have this new thing, this one plant. It's as tall as the state of Ohio 
out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean we just found. Wow. And so he's only about 30 feet in depth, but every all the ra- water around him is like 13, 14, 1,500 feet down. So how we did this, we did tag a super-sized hammerhead shark. And after they tagged him off the coast of Florida, he just made a beeline for like 1,500 miles down to the middle of the Atlantic. We're like, where the heck is the shark going? You know, hammerheads are hyper-adapted with the shape of their head to feed on animals that live in the sand. You know, stingrays, that kind of stuff, crabs. That's what those, uh, the organ of amp, uh, their electrical sensing organs in their face. It's to detect, you know, electrical impulses underneath. And then they had the camera on it. And then out of the darkness, you just see green. And they're like, where is this shark? Right? And they finally found, figured it out. Uh, and we just covered uh, stellar sea cows maybe still being alive. And that's one of their habitats is these giant, these giant seagrass meadows that are connected to nothing out in the middle of the oceans. I don't know how I got started on that, but oh, just the biggest living things. <laughs> okay, that's why. Yeah, me either. Yeah. Well, and I'll I'll get us back on track because I think this is a great way to pe- present, you know, your perspective, and I'm really appreciating it here uh, because, well, I should ask you, you know, how do you guys approach the subject of cryptozoology? I do get the sense that you guys have the more uh, scientifically based approach. I've talked to people on the show who seem to come from a more religious based approach where they see everything through that lens. I myself, I, I like to straddle the line and, and try to go both ways and see really, you know, from a sociological perspective or a psychological perspective, like the person themselves and maybe even why they're experiencing it. But, um, yeah, where do you guys approach you know your typical well, cryptid case? Yeah, I can't, um, I'm I'm agreeing with you that it's definitely like a mixed bag, mm. I believe. Um, but it, I don't know. I I say I'll just speak for myself. I guess I think it's a, a some of these things are biologically sound, like they're just animals or creatures that just actually exist. That there's so little of them that you know they're not documented. Or they, and then on top of that, some of them may have some kind of like supernatural powers or something, you know, something that helps them, oops, uh, like, you know, go hidden or disappear or escape, you know. Um, but then the, I like what you said, the psychological thing, you know, uh, the mind can project or create anything. Uh, and, and then you get into like the religious or in even like the elemental side of it, like whether it's the, the earth, um, the earth's energy itself creating mm. these things or, and then, and then you got the whole extra dimension, extra dimensional creatures right. where they could be coming in. Um, so I don't, I don't think any one thing falls into one category. And, um, maybe one creature does, but like, on cryptids as a whole, I think it's just all of those things and probably more that I'm missing. Well, right. and uh, just to add on what you're saying, I think, yeah, and a lot of people from my assessment have like a very pragmatic approach to cryptids. They want to hear the stories. They want to hear the first hand accounts. They want to kind of be in the position of the armchair researcher or the, pro, you know, the professional researcher and, and kind of, see the whole spread of information and make a judgment. But when we approach the subject of cryptozoology from like this philosophical, you know, hot overlooking kind of perspective, maybe even a detached perspective, it, it does seem like there's something going on. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on this where humans are maybe leveling up or we're evolving to perceive beings that maybe we've perceived in the past but in a different context now we're seeing them in a context that's almost like updated to this new operating system that is the modern consciousness augmented in the ways that it is maybe we're less perceptive to these things because when you do look at you know a lot of the mythologies uh, they seem to be very populated with all sorts of non-human entities right so Mm -hmm. i wonder if there's something going on where as we understand these things to a certain level we almost enter into a different 
realm than we once were. And I, again, like it's, it's all for me, very philosophical and sometimes even hard to explain. So feel free to take it in any direction you want as far as responses go. Here, I'll respond to that because it made me spark a thought. What if um, instead the opposite has happened where society and human beings are being so uh, numbed, you know, and kind of right. dumbed, dumbed down in a sense to where these things are presenting themselves in ways. Having to scream. Yeah, basically, yeah. Having to, like, bust out saying, like, there's, there's more going on here. here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Wow. In ways that, I don't know. So I'm, I'm with, and I've, we've said this on the show before. I believe, uh, so I'm a Christian, but I was also a biologist. So that's a very, that was, those can be very uh, conflicting views for most people. To me, it wasn't. I know a lot of Christian biologists. I know a lot of atheist biologists. And, uh, but I'm just, that's kind of where my worldview comes from is both a religious and a scientific kind of angle. But I've also had plenty of the paranormal happen. I believe in the paranormal. I believe in stuff that science can't nail down. And we've had plenty of eyewitnesses on the show that have just seen the most insane things that we know and trust. And that's probably my favorite thing about the show is locals yeah, that have come forward and just told us, cause we're that those people now we're comfortable to be around. And you're like, Greg is the one I always point to cause he's been a friend of our family forever. And he had a Bigfoot encounter. He told nobody until he came on our show and talked about it. And then after that, now he's got Bigfoot in his yard. He feels good about everything. Like yeah. he goes to Bigfoot festivals and he has fun with it before that. No, it was locked up. Um, but for, Cryptids and the paranormal, which I'll talk about in a second, if that's okay. That, uh, but for the the psychological aspect, or I think both are endangered, kind of in a way. I think cryptids are way down for the flesh and blood type, and that's animals in general. We just talked about shoebill storks are officially declared extinct, and it's, it hurts us deeply. That's a sh- that's a bird that was very famous on our show for a long period of time. Uh, I got literally a, a wonderful lady a listener that actually had an encounter with one here in North America. I got a four foot tall drawing of one that she did. That's gorgeous in the next room. Uh, so I think that they're on the down low and then even stuff like the Fay and these forest elementals uh, that we've had a lot of eyewitnesses again on the show. Um, but I believe it was Lori's encounter that they got so violent around one big tree in this last little park in a highly urbanized area. And then we had, well, the macabre podcast girls, Mm-hmm. When they got violent around that, that small, they thought it was a Native American mound, but it was most likely a fey mound, that they are being so heavily encroached on, they're losing their energies, they're losing their properties, and even if you want to call it their tribes, these groups of animals are paranormal beings, are interdimensional stuff, they're getting less and less. So I think that's why they're getting more and more violent, or more and more, like you said, like vocal. Yeah, right. is because they have to like scream and hey, we're still here, we're still apart. And I think uh, well, technology's been a big nail in their coffin. Both there's some people that have the uh, the electricity theory, which I'm sure you guys have talked about on your show and come across that electricity is actually is what killing the paranormal. Because mm. if you look at ghost encounters before and after uh, electricity start running power lines, it drops down by like 400 percent. Wow, it almost goes to like negative numbers because. We all know people that have ghost encounters, but we're running these circles. Yeah. You know, there's still plenty of people that haven't. Uh, but with cryptozoology, until very recently, it was just a biology term. By really recently, I'm going to say 15, 20 years. It's pretty recent. Yeah, I was going to say somewhere in there. Where cryptozoology, I'm sure you know, but for the listeners, the actual term cryptozoology or cryptid, there's three meanings. One is an unextinct animal. Uh, so the coelacanth is the best one for that. You know, disappeared from the fossil record, 66 million years, then popped back up in Madagascar. Now we have four massive breeding colonies in the world, two different species. Uh, so that's just a cryptid that these these Madagascar fishermen were like, no, they still, we never stopped catching them. They're always here. You know, they're hard to get because they're really deep, but every, you know, we get them every season. Uh, the next one is a purely undocumented animal by science. And almost always with that group, the locals always have, they know it, like an animal. Uh, when you kind of look at those, uh, like if you look at the Congo, for example, Mokele and Bembe, and oh, you got to remind me of the... Is it Kaya Muni? The Kaya Muni dinosaur? Yeah. 
Yeah. Good thing I had that so, one in my notes. <laughs> oh no, the Kayamunis. Uh, no, that's the Australian one. The the oh. Northern Australian one, the Killer Emu. Oh okay. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. That emu. is the yeah. emu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now there was a giant. There's little pterosaurs in the Congo. Oh wow. That okay. are violent, like piranha. They they. But when you talk to the Congonese people, uh, there are they, they talk about mythology and then they talk about real animals, and those are the two they kind of put in the real animal group. And if you throw away that it looks like a sauropod, these long necked dinosaurs, because that did not start being described that way until a bunch of white uh, Europeans and white Americans came in looking for it and showing them pictures of dinosaurs. The early accounts would say that it kind of looks like that, but no tail is what they would say. And then they would kind of give them like goods, like chocolate and stuff like that. Like, oh, no, yeah, you want a dinosaur? Yeah, tail. Uh, the biggest difference, though, is Mokil and Bambi, when they draw all the tracks, three toes, sauropods had five. We have some amazing, especially uh, Texas and stuff like that, we have some amazing fossilized, these giant animal tracks. And you can see five toes. I mean, they got five toes. Uh, some of them have the, what you call a dew claw on a dog, you know, that thumb positions further up on the leg so you don't really get four toes. But And then the last one is misplaced animals. So we have a couple really good examples here in the U.S., uh, we did the hyenas in North America. Everybody knows what a hyena looks like. That's a very distinct animal in your mind. You see one out in Iowa, though, that's a problem. Or the emus that are running wild in Michigan right now. <laughs> or the wallabies of the UK. Mm. Wallabies have actually exploded in northern parts of the UK and are fully wild. The surviving winters breeding thousands of them now. Oh, wow. Uh, I highly suggest everybody look up the videos of them. They're, they're cool because it's you think of a, a wallaby or a kangaroo as this hot climate Australian mammal, and they're doing just fine. The emus in Michigan. So I've, this is the one that I get in fights with sometimes with some listeners. Now, it's no, normally this is the our show. It's normally when we come on somewhere and I share this. Uh, three years ago, eight or six emus got out. I can't remember the number now. An, a small, even number. And they're like, we caught them all. And they caught, like, say, there was six got out. They caught six. Well, then about eight months later, and it, but it took them like a year and a half to catch them. He, like six months after that, they caught another eight. And people are still seeing what they're saying is like four or five foot tall dinosaurs running around the woods in Michigan. And just this past November, they caught another eight. And some guys are claiming there's, there's flocks of like 30 of them now, 40 of them. Uh, they're doing fine. You know, and they're just, they're tough animals. And the lower peninsula of Michigan Coyotes is about the only predator. A couple, you know, they DNR said there's no mountain lions. I've seen one there. There are mountain lions. But a mountain lion is going to look at that thing like, that's not normal for me. <laughs> yeah. It's not worth it, right? That's a dinosaur. Better avoid. So those are kind of your, your groups of cryptids, or at least the old school version. Uh, more into modern day, like stuff like the Mothman is getting lumped into cryptozoology, which is perfectly fine. But that's in our, and I think we share this opinion. Uh, more of a dim interdimensional creature. I think it does have biology just from somewhere else. You'd call that, if it was here, it's, uh, we all fit in the same biosphere. Mm -hmm. So plants, animal, fungus, eukaryotes, prokaryotes, all the, the same biosphere. You can connect us to the last common relative. Mothman has our kind of traits also, but these traits of flying without flapping, this high pitch, and people getting really sick around it seems like high radiation deposits in its body well let me ask you this because and you're sparking so many interesting thoughts Sorry, and, I no 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 you're you're great and i think this is why i wanted to ask the the questions i did because you're helping me set this stage before we really look at some of the actual cases but when it comes to things like insects uh things like octopus there are certain creatures that science has found like you know, maybe like a gap in the sure. origin way, you know, fossil record stuff. Right. And to pair that with some mythologies that I've read, one of them, I think it comes from the Hindu mythological world where there was a point in history where humanity remembers spiders being introduced and they came from the moon is what the Hindu people in this mythology, mm -hmm. they say the spiders came from the moon. Right. And you pair that with the fact that like spiders just seem to block like like a blip just appear on the fossil record out of nowhere. Maybe science will have an explanation for that in the future. But I start to wonder if like 
what we're experiencing with Mothman, as you're putting it's an interdimensional being, uh, as to the best of our description and knowledge of what that even means is interdimensional. Maybe we're like phasing into that higher vibration and, you know, the Mothman in a million years will be, you know, an accepted fact. But right now right. it's like still kind of phasing into reality the same way maybe we could see the octopus doing that at some point in ancient times. Or, pods, man. Yeah. Could, uh, there's biologists still arguing if they're Earth species or not. Right. Uh, and it's due to their black DNA and their chromosome counts and all these crazy things that they don't, they make sense, but they don't make sense kind of deal. And it just is a lot of people. And we talk about this a lot also is science argues. You can look up and find a accredited scientist to back pretty much any claim, either side of anything. And so it's not what I hate about it is when somebody's like, well, you know, science shows this. Yes, I'm sure you did find the article where a an accredited scientist, a, you know, a well-respected man or woman did say that. But I can also go and find a well-respected man or woman on the other side of that field. Scientists yeah. argue professionally and unprofessionally but was all it, the time. Was it peer-reviewed? Oh, my. Don't even start <laughs> that. Like, we don't have time for that tonight. Everybody at home, look into what it means to be peer-reviewed. It's the dumbest thing right. ever. Well, and that's somebody that did academia. Dumb. Well, and that's why it's a, a privilege to have someone with your perspective on the show and our friend Jay here on the show as well. Because I get a lot, I, I'm starting to sense that Jay and I come from a very similar perspective of where we're like, bullshit. You know, we have a good radar for bullshit. And, you know, you, 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 you know what you're talking about, Justin. That's just, it's pretty obvious. So, and I think that's why me and Jay get along because we never really fight, we pick. But there's never been any issue that we're really like so hard set on. We're like the other one's so wrong, except maybe space. I mean, but not a serious fight. I mean, at the end of the episode, we're like, all right, it's whatever. Oh yeah, true. We're never going to change each other's views on what uh, on some of these topics. Well, and I do want to reserve. We don't have to get into the validity of space, but I, I do think that there's a place in this conversation where that'll come up because I saw in your notes you mentioned flying saucers as atmospheric beings, or or maybe you didn't Animals. use the term flying saucer, but uh, it's relevant as far as the podcast goes because yesterday or the day before, I had a conversation with uh, Ryder Lee from the Raised by Giants podcast, and he broke down how the original Flying Saucer witness never even used the term Flying Saucer, didn't describe what he saw as a Flying Saucer, and, and this whole weaponized folklore has been built around that. To destroy the community, for sure. Well, and I think that's kind of an aspect of this, where people experience real things, and because there is this boogeyman, there's this, you know, psychological kind of control Sorry. system that is being used against us, there's, like, men in black or whoever who come and kind of manage it. Maybe they pay off academics and shady boardroom or you know shady you know <laughs> universities and whatever but yeah maybe they don't even have to there's enough cognitive dissonance to where people are crusading against these ideas without being coerced into it but i just think as far as science goes as far as religion goes there is a middle ground that we're still progressing towards you know we have this erroneous idea that oh man has We've conquered every frontier. We we've we've done everything there is to do, and we've seen every aspect of this realm, and and we've figured it all out. And I, I think that's just you know that's that's just a, a corporate pitch Asinine. that somebody came up with in the fifties. You know, like it's just ridiculous to what think you're saying that way. For, that? for what we know nothing. Oh yeah, well I, yeah, I know nothing. I know, but you know, we you scream that that we know yeah. nothing as a species. Oh yeah, yeah. Anyone right. that thinks they know something. And, I, and that's a good point. It's it, especially in the the fields we walk in and work in. There's no such thing as an expert, and I would say there's no such thing as a professional. You know, we have some buddies that are probably as close as I would say to a professional researcher. Yeah, like Lyle and Ken. You know, the, and Feldrum da, or Daryl in their own fields, but they don't know, and they'll admit that all those guys are just you know they they have their thoughts. But they don't know. There's not a Bigfoot or a gray laying on a slab publicly. 
<laughs> yeah, I want to make that clear. True, probably. I do think they're in some government or some third party entity's back door sitting on a slab. But I just think, uh, I think it's all of it that you, you got to have. And it's really, we try to do as best as we can. Every human has bias when we start doing these episodes of picking stuff, like trying to just get the information out there, not putting our own biases. Like I said, I'm Christian. So I'm going to look at whether I like it or not. I'm going to look at stuff through a Christian lens, but I'm also that, you know, that scientist and Jay's always the skeptic no matter what, which is great. In a sense. Yeah. I mean, it is. I mean, we, we I'm have like the we weirdest skeptic. fun fights. Yeah. I'm the weirdest skeptic. I'm the skeptic that believes in everything. Yes. Cause <laughs> so, some of the stuff you believe in with no proof, just, but it makes so much more sense than what we're told. I'm not going to argue that. So that's why. I hope well, we answered a question. Well, no, and I, that's why I think there is this middle ground, and it's exactly what I'm sensing with your dynamic. That's why I think your show is doing great and has you guys clearly have good chemistry for this kind of discussion. And it's important to approach these matters from that position because it's far too often that science dismisses it in this dogmatic way. And then oftentimes, you know, the only way people are introduced to this stuff is through television that sensationalizes it or yeah. through, you know, in, in maybe more extreme situations through like religious figures who convince them that it's all demonic. Right. And I don't discount the fact that there are possibly de demonic entities or evil entities mm -hmm. that could be affecting us. And that's a whole conversation we can certainly get into. I was going to say, like, that's a whole big box, especially with aliens, quote unquote, real aliens right now, is that for me, I mentioned shadow biospheres or different biospheres earlier. An alien would have to look so quote unquote alien for me to even kind of consider it being actually from another planet, our galaxy or our, you know, universe, because the likelihoods of a, and I don't believe in the full theory of evolution. I do believe species adapt and change over time and all that. Uh, but the theory of evolution has a lot of problems at the start, in my opinion, because they don't, they've never figured that out and they right. just kind of let everybody kind of skim over that. So the theory of evolution has a lot of problems. Right. Species do adapt and change over time. Well, and yeah. I think you're spot on there. And that's why it's so important to kind of understand that nuance when we do yes. discuss these things in terms of science, because there is that all ever present. Uh, anomaly factor that science always dismisses because it's too hard to explain, but religion explains it. And I think Genesis, we just had a conversation on the show about Genesis and, and the speed of life and, and or light and, and what that entails for life. And, and I'm more and more as I mature, uh, someone who believes in creationism in the sense that we were created. I think that's just evident when you do take that leap into what science is really saying and mm -hmm. not saying when you read between the lines. Exactly. And, uh, and religions and mythologies from ancient times give us a similar picture, which is always interesting. And, and as, as, you know, as well with these cryptids, as we call them now, we have a picture in ancient times of a, a world full of different beings. I'm talking dragons, elves, fairies, as you mentioned before, fairies. Blemies. What, what's that? Which one? Blemies. Blemies. Oh, Jay's, Jay's <laughs> mic stopped working there. That's all right. Well, there's, bl show. there's brownies. There's all, there's all sorts of creatures. I mean, I remember as a kid, there would be like these fun little like illustrated books and it'd be like a you know cryptozoology you know animal guidebook right and it, it it was half fairy tale folklore kind of stuff half like modern eyewitness kind of stuff but it definitely informed the way i see the world <laughs> maybe it's one of the reasons why my family thinks i'm crazy but <laughs> I've been in, in, in nature enough to understand that there's this animistic force that maybe in special circumstances, maybe in these like ecological hot spots, the, 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 it's like a womb and a new species can kind of like blip in based on some kind of circumstance and Maybe sure. cryptids are that maybe there, maybe there's something beyond that where it's almost like a, uh, a balancing mechanism. I often wonder that with invasive species, like how often did invasive species 
get moved around in ancient times and like how has nature responded to that over long periods of time and there's a lot of you know worry about that kind of thing nowadays but the the opossum made its way out of wherever the all the marsupials were generated down there in Australia over Guandana land and up through South America into North America right so the possum was at one point an invasive species and and made its way into the whole fold of symbiosis um and yeah who knows maybe sasquatch is that where nature is getting logged and the trees are coming down and all this stuff is happening and this just like man beast this wild version of humanity comes to scare people out of the woods is is like a last ditch effort to protect it you know in this kind of like mm -hmm. ultra consciousness kind of way so to the the bigfoot angle of i think you were probably gonna say the same thing is that uh and i think we're both kind of believers in this there's many different things we're kind of lumping under the bigfoot term uh, very flesh and blood things. I do think there is a creature, whether it's ancient human or much, much older creatures that just happen to co-evolve to look like it's called convergent evolution to where animals that are not related end up looking very similar because they're doing similar niches, uh, you know, hands and stuff like that. Because we've had a lot of people on that have seen Bigfoot and they've looked very people, but they've looked very not people also. Uh, some of the biggest ones is, and it's a weird one, is like some of the genitalia, right? You th hear these people that talk about Bigfoot and they don't, a lot of them don't talk about that. There's a couple out there that do. A lot of them don't talk about it, right? And that could be that it's very small, like much more, like some of the great apes, like gorillas, uh, they're not very present. You know, it's still, it, the, the instruments are still there, but they're not huge compared to the body mass or anything like that. Or they're internal, like some other ancient mammals, you know, stuff like that. Like a dog? Like, like well, it's partially dogs, you know, they have the sheath that's outside. But even oh, before yeah. that, you know, there's some that aren't. Right. They don't even have that. Like any cetaceans, for example, they're aquatic. But, oh. And Bigfoot's the manatee. Uh, but there's also, I think, this forest guardian and fey, fey connection to where either this is the face that we've had a lot of people on that have had the scary Bigfoots where they have glowing red eyes and they do weird stuff. They walk off cliffs and they, like a cartoon. And they just keep going, but you know there's a drop off right there. And partially, I think that is that the the fae know what you want to see. They kind of get that feeling. So this is the face you want us to wear. This is the the costume that you want us to wear. So we'll wear the costume for you, right? We want to interact with you. This is the this is the getup we're gonna wear. And that's the thin big plus that kind of don't seem right, glowing red eyes. They do the paranormal stuff. They have orbs and stuff like that. It's probably you know the other fae. Or the more ancient forest guardians or the forest itself just being scary, hitting that primal note that all humans fear just to kind of be like, get out of here, you're killing me. Uh, and uh, the earth is one living ecosystem uh, or one living thing you want to go with. There's a, there's a group of animals called cyanophores, uh, and there's several other different things like them. But they are tons of different organisms that have all linked up to form the one body. The Portuguese man of war is a famous one. Everybody thinks it's a jellyfish. It's not. That's tons of different animals all holding on to each other to find, form one body to control and move and stuff. And that's kind of, in my opinion, what the Earth is. Uh, Antarctica is just as connected to South America, to the rainforest, to the Sahara. It's all one thing. And I think that's where humans right now are struggling, is that our worldviews are big, but they're also very small. We're very us centric so we've kind of stepped out and i think that's why we're not seeing as much stuff and we're not being connected with much stuff because we kind of humans think we've we're out of the ecosystem now especially these people in cities and urban centers and stuff you don't see where your food comes from you don't see nature you don't see that every little thing you do as a species interacts and damages or helps the whole planet that you are a part of uh we're beating up the earth like it doesn't matter. Like, it's not us. Mm -hmm. You're still, every time you hurt the earth, it's you. It's, you know, it's, it's a, you are a piece of that thing. Whether you, whatever religion you are, what, you know, it doesn't matter. I don't know. But that's just kind of why I think we're seeing less of these things and maybe why they're getting more and more violent and scarier. Like the dog man, for example, if they are forest elementals, they switch from the big hairy guy that is just like the woods keeper to the, the guard dog. Yeah. This thing that's just purely, 
what some people call demonic, and I think they may have that angle to them. Also, you know, it's it's a spectrum, but this just you know slaughtering people and being just the teeth and the nails, this pure embodiment of how ferocious mm. nature can be. Well, and it, you know, it has parallels with the werewolf floor and and the idea that you know humans can can destroy and be evil, right? I think that's a big part of that whole werewolf th- werewolf psychology is with the the serial killers and yeah, it's it's something that when it comes to the world that we're experiencing today, I'm not surprised at all that in ancient times when you look at like the Egyptian pantheon, you see dozens of mythological figures with dog heads, bird heads, and we even have, you know, counterparts to the Sasquatch. Uh, what is it? Enkidu from the Epic of Gilgamesh or, mm-hmm. or one of those stories, um, you know, is, is essentially described as we would call a, a Sasquatch today, like a giant hairy person. And the yeah. wild man myth goes through all different countries. And one thing that, you know, I often go back to is like, initially the world of you know science was a lot more open to these ideas and one one guy that kind of i don't know I, i've talked about him on the show recently cuz i found his book um the it's called the great book of jungles or the book of great jungles his name's Ivan T. Sanderson. He's more oh, famous. Yeah, no, I got a bunch of his books. Cool, yeah, so you know who he is. He's famous for his research into the abominable snowman and uh, kind of popularized that whole cryptid. And, and it's definitely a whole distinct thing from the Sasquatch in some ways. But what really fascinated me about Sanderson was his in his book of jungles, which is a book about jungles, he goes into... Um, the pygmies and how pygmy groups of people are, are not like deformed or maligned types of people who like, you know, became maladapted and had to go and f- hide in the jungle. They've actually evolved over time to be really well adjusted to their environment in the jungle. Yeah. And it just kind of demonstrates this spectrum of morphology that, humanity can can conform to you know it's not just people within you know the the stri- the range we know today pygmies and and maybe sasquatch or these much larger giants like we we find skeletons of often associated with the mounds and different archaeological sites i mean it really puts this in a different perspective on you know what's possible biologically oh i mean there's animals that break the laws of biology. We could do that for four hours if we really wanted. <laughs> That's uh, something that I haven't talked a lot about on the show. I don't know. I mean. We have <laughs> a side show called Freaky Phone of Friday. Okay. And everybody at home, check it out. They're like 15 minutes long and they come out every Friday. And we just highlight a freak of nature. Right. But really all nature is freaky. That's kind of the, the let me of the Let show. me run this idea by you because my friend Juan and I from the Juan on Juan podcast. Juan. I think you guys know Juan. We do uh, we do a show together for our supporters where we just talk. And every episode, I try to like jam in an animal news segment. That's just what I call it. Mm-hmm. And one one episode, we talked about um, something that really kind of at first I was like, oh, whatever. But then it started to sink in, and I'm like, huh. So let me ask you this: are You are you familiar with like when you look at a peacock feather? how the colors on the peacock feather are there but they're not there because the you know when you look at a peacock feather under a microscope it's actually brown it's not it's not right you know blue or or green or purple it's something called like i don't know di- diffusion or diffraction uh, it's basically structural like diffraction a crystal and you you know you put light through it and mm-hmm. you get the rainbow coming out but you didn't put a rainbow in right right so it's a lot of the refraction and light so it's what it was absorbing is the actual color. Right. But those, those kind of structures are different. Uh, but yeah, no, it's, and we talked about the Bigfoot having this outer layer of fur that is the red color everybody sees. And when they go in, they actually have muscle groups on their fur to lift it up. And the undercoat is black. And there's a couple of really good encounters with that where people thought a Bigfoot was disappearing, like melting into a different universe. And they sit there and they really watch and they can see the Bigfoot still there. They just changed color. Right. 
in a match, whatever they're in. Well, and what, what really blew my mind about kind of going into the intricacies of this phenomenon in nature is it's not just with peacocks and, and their feathers or birds and their feathers, you know, scales and other, you know, types of, mm-hmm. of natural structures, but also the octopus does this in like an electronic way within its cells, you know, like the, the it's the same concept going on. Chromatophores. Yeah, when, when, the, when the octopus is is changing its, you know, colors to conform to what's around it. It's it's essentially the same process, but, you know, in a different form. Muscle, so the, the octopus thing is amazing to me. That So it's called chromatophores right. is the actual groups. They're a pigment cell that have muscles on them. We're talking about an individual cell that has a muscle on it, and they're the same color. They're all, they're, the cells do not change color. What they do is they stretch and contract the cells to match colors. So it's like having a Sherman Williams in your skin, and they will match whatever, and their brains are highly complex. Hmm. What are you laughing at? Oh, you just went, hmm, okay. But no, so with that, they can do all this, and they can match textures too, which a lot of people don't realize, is they can have, and their the skin cells that don't have pigment, they actually have these other groups of muscles that can match textures of coral or sand, uh, the mimicry octopus is a famous one, you know, looking like other venomous animals. They swim, they'll wrap their tentacles and they're and swim like a sea snake. They'll look like a hermit crab. Um, a squid they did that test with. Uh, it's a squid that has the best mimicry or camouflage of any any cephalopod on the planet. So it's already the best of the best. And this biologist, and everybody at home can look at this study. I don't remember off the top of my head. Made a pattern that this animal had no chance of copying all these crazy colors and stuff like that. Couldn't this animal couldn't copy it. They put this little squid in there you see this little squid look around and it's looking, it's looking, it's looking. And the biologist is telling it's getting stressed. Like it's, it can't figure out how to do this pattern and it's trying, it's flashing colors, trying to figure out how to match. And then just something they never knew they could do. They went transparent. So it kind of said, screw you to the biologist. I maybe can't match it, but I can go see through. And what that is, why they don't do that very often, because that's a question a lot of people have is, well, if you can go transparent, why don't they just do that? That's stressful on the body because it's stretching those chromatophores to max. So it'd be like you being really, really tensing every muscle. Yeah, you can do it, but that sucks, right? If you have an easier way, you know, you're going to take the easier way. Um but nature is crazy. Well, uh, and and I guess you, my my train of thought with that is like if that can occur in smaller organisms, what if it's going on in higher order organisms that we're not even able well, to sure. perceive yet, right? Like these atmospheric beings that uh, I hope we could get into. Maybe now is a good time. But you had a thought. Please continue. Oh, I just going to tell you one superpower. Uh, so animals have superpowers. Do you know there's a fish that shoots lasers out of its eyes to kill its food? <laughs> well, I I've I've seen the what is it? Uh, uh, it's some sort of mollusk that does like a sonic boom, but I think that's different. So those are there's pistol shrimp and mantis shrimp. You're right, right. Pistol shrimp, shrimp have a claw. They shoot a superheated jet of water. It's about 800 degrees Fahrenheit and right. cook their food alive. Right, right. This man or mantis shrimp hit something hard enough it creates a sonic vacuum. That yeah, that's or, what I'm sorry, thinking of. It's an implosion. Yeah. And then that just kills stuff. I mean, that sucks <laughs> to be around. Uh no, the electric stargazing fish, their faces on the top of their head, they look straight up. They live in the sand. Uh forever biologists were looking at these animals and they couldn't figure out these animals would stare at these little prey items and then they would die. So these biologists couldn't figure out how they were killing the, their prey. And they're thinking this is like the old men that stare at goats kind of deal. <laughs> they're just willing this animal, this other animal to die. Finally, they figured out that electric eels, everybody knows electric eels can generate electricity. Uh, do you know if an electric eels mouths open, they will kill themselves. They have specialized pores and electric proofing. That's why they look like they're blind. Anybody's ever seen a picture of their eyes are all cloudy. They actually have an electric proof skin over their entire body. But if they open up a little bit, they'll kill themselves. So these stargazers actually have an organ in the corner of each eye that shoots a concentrated bolt of electricity at prey items and either stuns it or kills it. So these little fish, when they're not little, they get like they get pretty like two foot long, shoot and a bolt of electricity out of their eyes to kill things. So if anybody ever thinks like a Bigfoot or a Mothman or some of these other cryptids we're going to talk about aren't biologically possible, 
Nature has cooked up stuff you can't even imagine. Yeah, that's... We have the old men that stare at goats in the sea. Yeah, that's why this is so fascinating to me. And some people are like, oh my gosh, why are we talking about zoology? But it, it, it's, it's... It's the same thing. Yeah, it, it's exactly the same thing. And I think part of the deception in our education system is to kind of give us this really boxed in view of 100%. what's possible right and they'll they'll tell you you know some funny things maybe you'll, you'll luck out and have a cool science teacher some you know along your path who who who's open to this stuff but if you only know what like you see on television i remember there was uh, a show that stan lee put together uh, Superhumans. Yeah, and it was all about like the amazing things humans can do, and I always thought like there might have been a parallel on like Discovery or, or Animal Planet for that with yes, animals. Uh, uh, oh, it's the top ten, well, top ten animals or something like that's what it was called. And I, I'm I remember seeing these shows and thinking like, wow, this is this is where I want to spend my energy because i've you know i'm a superhero nerd when i was a kid that was something i was into so it's like oh yeah all these things in, are possible they're not just like they don't just imagine them like they're maybe exaggerations of things that do happen i mean you talked about the 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 squid stressing its chromatophores to you know max exertion humans have demonstrated that ability in like super high you know danger situations you know particularly mothers protecting their children sure. you know demonstrating like superhuman strength and the woman is like you know 110 pounds and Picking up a tractor. yeah exactly so i think you know we just really as far as science goes we're we're only getting a like a 20 percent you know that iceberg kind of metaphor mm -hmm. of what's really possible possible before well, we go i'm sorry we're i was gonna say well that's you know, what happens when you move at the speed of science well i was going <laughs> to say something to that to scientist credit science discredit hmm. you know what i'm gonna you probably know what i'm gonna say i right? am the science yeah oh my gosh that guy no so with peer review we kind of mentioned that earlier everybody look into it uh that whole thing scientists do incredible research on the personal level constantly most scientists, true scientists, are much more open-minded than anybody would ever think. The peer review or publication process is all done by administrators of universities. People have no degrees in this stuff. People have no research in it. So the scientists are very boxed in themselves of what they, they have to publish stuff, right? They keep their tenure to keep their jobs. So they, if they're not going to get published, it's not worth their time to spend on it because they're going to lose their job in the long run. So these, these few scientists actually have good paying jobs mm. get stuck in these positions of having to pump out crap to satisfy people in an administrative position that have no, no, no degree. And you don't need a degree in science to be a scientist in my opinion, but no degree in science, no care for that, no love, you know, passion for that. They're like, okay, we want this type of thing is what we need. We need this type of thing. And it's a guy that's running a magazine, essentially, mm. telling these guys that are doing the research what to do. Editors. And that is the biggest problem in mainstream, quote, unquote, science. Right. And it's not scientists. And I hear scientists get so much hate. They're just people, right? They're just, they, some of these guys. Most have, of them. Most of them. Some of these guys and ladies have the biggest passion for the stuff we're talking about. And they're in incredible labs. And they'll never get the chance to test anything. And then you have the people that are the really poor scientists that are doing this stuff and they have no backing, no accreditations as far as, you know, Yale's not backed them or nothing like that. But those are the guys that don't care, right? They're not, we don't have to go through a filter process. Uh, so that's why we can publish whatever we want and run these experiments any way they want. So I guess what I was just saying that, that for everybody at home, keep in mind that when you see the words peer reviewed study, that's garbage. You have to pay for a peer reviewed study and it's picked by an admin team that has no backing in it. And you hear these big universities kicking out stuff. Just remember that guy or gal that's been in there for 30 or 40 years. This, this lovely scientist has crazy ideas too. Like we do, mm. they really do. They're people most of the time, like us, you know, but they don't, that's not what gets them. That's not what keeps their job. Right. Yeah. I just it's wanted to say system. that little thing. Cause that's something that they're, I worked in labs and I worked in all these facilities yeah. and, about half of my lab believed in Bigfoot and half of them did. And then I, we can share a funny story at the end 
about a guy that didn't believe in Bigfoot, and then is probably what made part of our Bigfoot career. Well, as you're as you're saying that, I recall talking to Dr. William Craig Birdwell, who is a supporter of my podcast and a really really interesting guy, and. I'll admit a lot of what he told me about went straight over my head. I, you know, he's a real scientist. Um, he's the father of the unit simulacrum. He discovered, uh, and I'm reading this off my, my podcast summary, but he works on uh, uh, analyzing lipids using liquid chromatography. So it might even be related to what we're talking about with the octopus. But, uh, yeah, he's discovered some really interesting stuff and made the point of, like, yeah, your podcast is like one of my best chances of getting this kind of stuff out there cuz cuz when when I try to get this stuff, you know, peer reviewed or, you know, published, they always look at me like I'm crazy and he, what he's talking about kind of con- connects with what we were talking about earlier with Genesis. Like he he's kind of looking at how, you know, things begin, the origins mm-hmm. of on a chemical mm-hmm. structural level. So interesting stuff. Maybe check out that interview and I'll put you in touch with them if you have any interest. But uh but oh, yeah. definitely. I would yeah. love to talk to him. Yeah. To, to cool. get somebody like biologists are, I was a biologist, you know, I was a I was a field biologist. Uh so I was a dirty biologist, what other scientists call it. Is you know, I was getting my I was getting dirty every day. And then I would send it to the lab guys. But for somebody like him to be brave enough to come out and like do this, you know, this is what kills your funding mm. talking about this kind of stuff. And it's, and like I said, it's nothing to do with actual science. It's to do with an admin team. that is just trying to run for a college or university or a research organization. You have to stick to the narrative. You do. And it's, and I just feel bad for the scientists because they get blamed, right? Well, Especially yeah. In our field. Oh yeah. You know, it's, it's always the scientist's fault. Like why aren't the scientists looking at it? They want to guys. They really do. They, they want to be the one they want to discover portals. They want to discover that, you know, they just, if they did, they wouldn't have a job and they have kids and families and all, you know, it's, you got to, everybody makes sacrifices. Well, all bow down to the system. Yeah. Well, and remember, it, there's a big difference between kneeling down and bending over. Yeah, That's no, it. absolutely. I, I know another scientist, Dr. Roger Spur, who he's convinced that every mountain is, uh, an organic being that died a long time ago and he'll point at mountains and show you how it shows like, you know, anatomy, structural anatomy. And I don't, yeah. I don't totally discount it. He's also done experiments where he's turned a chicken wing into solid rock <laughs> in a vat yeah. of mud with electricity, which is cool. It kind of shows how, you know, organic materials can petrify in a in a very fast sort of uh in the right circumstances but it conforms with the mythology that's local to where i'm from in new england and connecticut the native tribes have a legend about a mountain called sleeping giant mountain and it looks like a man lying on his back when you're driving towards it from far enough away and uh and surely it looked that way when they saw it. And they had a legend about these two giants and how they got into a fight with a thunderbird and died and became the mountains. So I'm like, that's kind of interesting because here's Roger Spur turning organic things into, you know, uh, stone with electricity. The Native Americans, they have a thunderbird. Clearly that's a reference to, you know, at least some sort of electro electrical process whether it was delivered by an actual bird or or not you know it you know i like to think in those terms but when it comes to the atmospheric beings what's going on you know above us and it definitely feels like this term egregore has has come up a lot in in the conversation of of cryptids and I wonder if there's a similarity there or if you guys find a distinction with like atmospheric beings as as a real natural phenomena as opposed to maybe like a conscious kind of thought form that's created and then has like agency in the world cuz to me it seems like they're described similarly. Um well I think I come from a different perspective than you probably. I just love picking on you. Okay. Um, but we both think that, like, with the UFO phenomena, a very small portion, sliver of it, is atmospheric creatures. Animals. Like, or or yeah. animals, fungus. Like, you're right. Yeah. I'm just saying I want to make clear that we're talking about Earth-originating species. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
just a small sliver, but it's in the reason being is because uh, we found there's a lot of similarities between the ocean and the atmosphere above us. Um, and if there's beings in the ocean that can flash lights like LEDs, you know, like mm. crazy colors, um, you know, why can't there be the same exact thing in the sky above us? Yeah. Slith, so building on slith, that, we just wrote right? an episode called Aeroplankton. Uh, just describing the species, the base level species in the upper atmosphere. So we live in what's called the troposphere, and then above that's the strat, and then the meso. And then there's more layers above that, but we don't really look at that for this study. Uh, so everybody's, what's, as a kid, what did you learn in school? The higher you go, do you remember? The less dense things become. And then what's temperature do? Becomes colder. And that's wrong. Okay. And then, but no, that's what we're taught. That's what right. was my point. Okay. The Rockefeller that, education system. <laughs> okay. Guys, okay. So there's layers and these layers are actually kind of hard layers in our upper, in our atmosphere. There's uh, it's just kind of how things filter out. So as you do go up in what's our layer, the trope or the troposphere, it does get colder and colder and colder, but sitting right when you meet the trope to the stratosphere is the ozone layer. Once you cross that barrier, it goes back and gets warmer again. And it's the warmest where the, the stratosphere meets the mesosphere. And it's sitting at like 45, 50 degrees, tons of liquid water. And that's a completely kind of against what average kids are taught. And I do school talks and that guy's, and, you know, our, our local teacher is very good about doing good stuff. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of against what you're taught. Like the average system, you know, it gets colder the higher we go up. You know, you'll freeze. You'll turn into big ice chunks as you go up. And you know, eventually you will. But there are these big, I mean, we're talking something. You know what? It's 50 miles wide in the whole planet. It's sitting at 50 degrees full of liquid water. Yeah. What was your, I'm sorry. No, I love what you're saying. And it's bringing to mind this idea. Um, maybe you guys are familiar with it, but it, I remember hearing about it in the context of Saturn and there's a time in human history where we remember Saturn having a different place in the sky. It was almost like lined up with the other planets in like this synchronized orbit. And one of the theories and also people remember like a purple sky back then because the Saturn, the theory is that it was dying as a star, but it was still emitting more light obviously than it does now and uh so the sky was purple and the thought there was that there was also a layer of ice in the that exact sphere that you're talking about maybe above it or where the water is now so you're kind of making me think of of that and and this idea that there was once an ice bubble at the time when the dinosaurs were on the planet and that's why maybe the the um atmosphere allowed for larger organisms and also it kind of goes into the electromagnetics of having that um relationship between that amount of water in that you know around the earth like that it, i mean obviously it's higher level stuff that i'm capable of eloquently articulating but maybe you're getting where i'm going with this where like as human beings we've been given this like very skewed <laughs> picture of where we actually are there's water up there and who knows maybe in ancient times it was it was ice and maybe that explains why things were were different back then i i don't know i that thought just kind of sparked when you when you were going along that that the lines of that and i appreciate it because i had no idea i was rockefeller fooled <laughs> i mean it, it's just what happened and, and we're still surprised peeling back like i said i i think my favorite episode we were doing all season it comes out monday and it's called Aeroplankton. It, Monday of recording this for everybody at home. You know, it's it's been out since this has come out. Aeroplankton. Because it, the there was a NASA study that we originally based all this stuff off of, and there was some species up there. But I'm going to try to remember the numbers roughly. So everybody at home, don't crucify me. I'm guesstimating what the numbers were. But there's like um, 40,000 species of fungus. Over 200,000 bacteria. There's also a handful of arthropods which is insects, spiders, scorpion, those kind of guys. Uh, but there's every clade that does not have a spine is found in the upper atmosphere in numbers. We're talking jellyfish. We're talking insects. We're talking all this stuff. So there's 
these jellyfish up there. And now we found out with aeroplankton, a bunch of cool stuff, that there are sea spray plankton. So when you see waves slam together and vapor shoots up, there's animals in that. And guess what? They can survive just as much in the ocean as they can in the upper atmosphere. They get wow. sent up there and they're living. So all this stuff with aeroplankton is amazing. And it's the largest environment on the planet tenfold. There's nothing that compares to it except the open ocean with similarities of being open, vast, right. you know, uh, very besides water, you know, very poor in cover, poor nutrients. And that's kind of where we see these transparent or super speed things. When you think of the fastest animals on earth, a lot of them are in the water. We're talking sailfish and stuff. And they're the open water guys. Cause they don't have a chance. They don't, they have to, they have to do these things. There's no cover. You can't sit and hide in something like in a forest or in a desert, you know, hiding under rocks. You don't have that chance. You just have to be faster than everybody. So these, these Mach 10 things that are described as being alive, and we'll get to the big guys. We'll get to the whales. I think the plankton are just as important. But we've had these raining blood events. And NASA, when they were first sending space people to the moon, and that's a contestable thing, you know, on the show and your show and all that, they were talking about hitting layers of green slime. Have you ever heard this? No. <laughs> they were watching the windshield, and it would be green for just a second. And then it would go back over. We now know what they're hitting is these massive schools of arrow, uh, arrow uh, algae. Huh. So algae, and then there's cyanobacteria, which aren't algae, but they do photosynthesize kind of. Uh, they are green when they're happy or blue when they're happy. And then they turn red and toxic when they're not. So we've had these raining blood events for millennia, and they make people sick right. when it rains blood. Have you ever been around a cyanobacteria bloom? It turns the water red like blood. Right. And they're highly full of dangerous compounds for people because it's a defense mechanism. They're agitated. We also are work, working on studies, and we most scientists that are working in this field believe that we thought that, you know, so for rain droplets and snow and ice and all that in the atmosphere, you need uh, a nucleus for each droplet or snowflake or whatever. A lot of them are these upper atmospheric animals, and we thought it was on accident just because there's so many of these guys up there, right? That you know, it's hex. We now think they're doing it on purpose to form favorable habitats. These giant clouds in the upper atmosphere are actually colonies of living organisms pulling water towards themselves to make favorable environments. And they control wind patterns. So these things that spore on the ground, like uh, we'll take uh, fungus or ferns, for example, which are a plant. Uh, they have these certain species of ferns have popped up all over the planet in extremophile environments. So, for example, like a spring, a hot water springs on the mountainside where there's no plants. And there are just, there's one little bit of hot water makes, you know, 30 square feet habitable. And there's these ferns there that are only native to California. And we're talking two, you know, continents away. How did that happen? The upper atmosphere carries these spores. So, Everywhere, if you come from a marine understanding, and you're talking about all these these vastness of, so these giant clouds are essentially coral reefs. Tons of little tiny organisms working together to make these vast bodies. Mm. And we're not talking about the lower level clouds. We're talking about these ones you look up in the sky, and they're just these massive clouds. are actually probably colonies of living things wow. that are pulling water vapor towards them. So we have the reefs, and we have the plankton. So what are we missing? the fish and the whales. Yeah. And I don't think we're missing them. I think they're there. Mm. Uh, we have, so like Jay uh, alluded to earlier, we believe the the giants are only about 5% of UFO sightings every year. Cause you uh, mo like MUFON, which is, you know, is a fine organization and some of these other UFO organizations throw these ones out because they have tentacles or they have these weird compounds that don't quite fit what they're looking for. Right. You know? Uh, and then like mountain ranges have these giants. So the, some of the common ones, Giant manta rays is where we got our start. These giant manta rays, and tons of people have seen them for thousands of years, the more we look back. And, you know, sometimes they're about the size of a Boeing, you know, 757. You know, your classic, everybody at home, that's your, if you're going to fly on a plane, that's probably the plane you're going to fly on, unless it's like a sky bus or something. So, you know, a couple of hundred, you know, 100, like 20, 130 feet long, and about 80 or 90 feet wide. And it's like a manta ray without a head. So they call we call that's why we call manta rays. It's just the basic shape. And when they're seen low, they flutter so slow. So they're not pulling themselves up with the flapping of their quote unquote wings. They're most likely have a gas filled organ 
and they're just steering with these wings. But everybody that we've had contact with that have seen these things, all the research we've done, it's a weird phenomenon with the man race is a sense of awe as in people seeing like humpback whales, mm. this truly massive organism, but you don't have any fear. Mm. And as a human, you know, we have instincts and we have, you know, and you can kind of get a good feel like around a tiger, people, even in zoos feel uncomfortable around tigers and big cat. You know, it's a bad thing for us as a species. But when these people see these manta rays just going real nice and easy from Florida to Kansas to China to Sweden, they just feel in all of these things. And they, and the one guy, our first one ever that came in to us, like that came to us to share this story. Yeah. Just then I asked him that. I'm like, how did it make you feel? And he's like, it was like seeing a way I wasn't scared. Me and my girlfriend weren't scared, but it was just, we both were crying at the end of the event because we knew we seen something that was so majestic. Mm. And then there's the giant jellies and they sound like, just like they are these humongous jellyfish in the atmosphere. Uh, there's a famous one in China with the military. They actually probably killed one. Uh, I don't know if you ever heard of that. No. The Zhang, Zhang, I think I'm going to say Zhang, Zhang Chow. I know the first word Zhang, uh, UFO encounter that where the Chinese right. military destroyed a UFO. And it was described as literally a massive, like 600 foot long jellyfish. Mm -hmm. And it was probably one of these guys that got knocked up out of the upper atmosphere and was struggling and it just got lit up by fighter pilots. Well, and that, right? It's just, I'm sorry. That was going to be my question. Like, it, are these typically only seen from really high, you know, elevations on mountains or no. only from airplanes? Oh, no. It's very rare to see them up there. Most of the time, yeah, they're down low huh. and they're almost always either, there's two, there's two criteria they're almost always seen around. Uh, either mountain ranges, which we can talk about, and thunderstorms, which we can talk about. Hmm. And there's other ones. There's, I mean, there's too many to go into tonight, but there's the, 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 the squids and the snakes and well, it, all it, these animals that fit niches it makes that are me, up there. It makes uh, me but, think of, uh, real quick, it makes me think of, like, weather shamanism and this idea that people can affect the weather with their thoughts or certain rituals, certain practices. And I've talked to somebody who knows a way to arrange different types of stones and affect the weather. People try to do that with organite and whatnot. But it also, and I, I'm wondering maybe what Jay thinks of this one is, you know, makes me question chemtrails a lot more. And maybe oh. these chemtrails aren't meant to go down, but they're meant to do something up Kill there. Right. Or, I'm yeah. Go to the bathroom. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know what they are. I mean, you see all this stuff online of what could be in there. Yeah. Aluminum, barium, all that stuff. I don't know. All I know is, I look up there, and there's something coming out of those planes mm. that shouldn't be coming out. And I've even seen one where it, it go, it's going, and then it stops, and there's nothing coming behind the plane, and then it starts up again. And if you're just going to tell me that's a natural phenomenon from the planes just flying through, it's just what happens, I'm just going to call BS mm. because it's not. I've seen many planes. Some of them have them. Some of them don't. It's just odd sometimes it's there really fast or some you know disappears really fast or sometimes it hangs around for like a couple hours so i yeah and we talked about that too kind of when uh um what are these things uh, yeah we did oh uh, these things i because i mentioned it what if they're spraying to kill the um you're right no no no, no. this we did on this episode on the aeroplankton episode that one's about to come out we talked about yeah. uh them spray, spraying, like, killing killing these things, like, killing, like, uh, you know, food source, you know. Like, so the aeroplanes are controlling the weather in a way, essentially. So if you want to take the reins, you got to kill the old guy that's running it. Yeah. Uh, so these, and it, there's been a lot of evidence coming out now that's showing that these aeroplanes are actually controlling the world's weather patterns huh. to benefit themselves. And that we, and that, that the chemtrails may be just there. To take away that so we can do it. Well, I also just thought of the idea, too, though, 
when you know when people do you know cloud bursting you know they're staring at the clouds and like in the minute scare it goes killing plankton what if they're what if they're actually not connecting with the clouds they're connecting with the animals within them yeah mm-hmm. and then manipulating them Life through their mind fairy. yeah yeah i think that's totally possible and you know before one of the things that came to mind as well are all the strange falls obviously there's all sorts of strange things that have fallen from the sky that have been documented mm-hmm. throughout history and mm-hmm. many organisms like fish frogs things without spines as far as i know a frog doesn't have a spine uh, frogs do ha- frogs and fish do have spines oh okay well sorry but that that kind of defeats my idea there but that's all right um but either but, way but no you're on it uh we we've done uh rain rain events yeah to where it seems like and our thought is that they may be throw up of these giant creatures that they're filter feeding out of some water environments. So raining bones, we did a whole episode on raining bones to where this giant thick black cloud, people were describing this, seeing this cloud in, in, during a thunderstorm being like, that's, there's something odd. And then it threw up millions of bones. Huh. So during that time, there was flooding in Louisiana and gar or, or type of armored fish. Uh, they got stranded and died in all these fields and we think that these things were eating them. These atmospheric creatures were eating all the dead bodies. Whatever they couldn't dig- digest like a bird of prey, they just throw up. Or whatever they didn't want. And the, the giant amoebas and the, the killer pink fog and the gray fogs. Mm-hmm. There's the- stories of these clouds, carnivorous clouds, for thousands of years. The other thing I that... that- really getting- Sorry. Well, the other thing that connects to this too, and I'm sure you have some things to comment on this, is airplanes. Oftentimes, they'll have like I forget what they call it. There's like a technical term in the airplane industry for like what they scrape off the planes, and scientists have found DNA from like all sorts of animals that you wouldn't expect to be up there, and uh, and then you know there's plenty of bird species that make their way up into the upper atmosphere so makes me think of them and like how are they interacting with these beings and and maybe even like uh the dna we find on planes what what can that tell us about what these atmospheric beings are ingesting and yeah how do they even how do they even come like come down and and feed like are they just scooping things up like a giant like uh like the way you know like an amoeba would like yeah. Absorb itself around a certain thing. I mean, that's happening. The pink fog of Florida is probably the most famous one of that. Uh, it's where about just people over the last probably 150 years have been describing in this small area in Florida, this pink fog that moves through and just leaves cleaned bones behind. Uh, the most recent one, I believe, was a, a hunter in like 08 that was fallen one and found like clean squirrels and stuff like that. And that would, you know, almost your uh, D and D blob, you know, the 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 slime, to where they're, you know, they're still gas filled, so they're light. But then you can connect it. To, we connect it with the Bermuda Triangle also. If you look at it, almost every time phenomena has happened in the Bermuda Triangle, there's one thing that connects it: a green fog. Hmm. And almost everybody describes this fog as almost. You remember? No. Alive. Okay. Everybody that went flew through it, everybody that had stuff, they're like, it's almost like the fog was alive. It's the green ooze from teen, uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2. <laughs> well, we talked about that. was It was the adult pink fog, uh, like moving off the coast. But why these things are seen around mountains and thunderstorms? So the same reason with the Thunderbird. The old legends of the Thunderbird started with, because they used to, why well, they named it the Thunderbird. Uh, depending which tribe you talk, because we, you know, there's t- tons of tribes in the Midwest, out West, and even some Appalachian tribes have Thunderbird legends. But a lot of those tribes don't talk about them having lightning as a power until much later on in the mythology. They thought they were the bringers of storms. So what happened is you would see these giant birds in front of the storm fronts, almost look like they were towing them in, mm. and they were bringing the storm behind them. The California condors are biggest bird in North America that's famous for it. Way before there was birds called teratorns that were just massive. I mean, man eaters. These these predatory birds that are all extinct as far as we know. Um, so why that is is though there's pressure fronts, and these gliding species 
can use these pressure fronts as elevators back up or elevators back down. But quite the opposite sometimes happens is they get just kind of swatted down. And we see that with some of the aeroplankton as they get like from the, so these some of these thunderstorms are so tall, they're scraping the edge of the stratosphere. So they're actually knocking animals out of that edge that don't want to be down here. So we're talking 10 to 11 miles, you know, some of these storms are tall. So these big gliders and these big jellies could be getting caught in that being knocked down. And why you see them in mountain, mountain ranges is they're natural atmospheric elevators. Wind hits them and they go straight up. So if you're a glider or an airfield species and you're trying to get back home, essentially, that's just your that's your ride up. So that's why I just remembered that from earlier. And it coincides with the upwell of nutrients and food sources. 100%. That's the other, thank you, is that the land-based, it's called detritus, which is just organic and inorganic nutrients that kind of gather in the air or the water. That's where they all get shot up into the atmosphere. So if you're this big filter feeding thing, that's the best place. It's a buffet. You're just sitting there essentially with your mouth open, just feeding. And we see whales do that. Why do we think whales, you know, travel very, very dangerous distances through dangerous waters for these Antarctic events? It's because it's upswells into those waters that create, uh, you know, krill blooms, these shrimp blooms, and they just no, you can eat buffet. So it's worth it to travel across, you know, what's virtually a desert and the ocean to get to these areas that you know is an all-you-can-eat buffet. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. And it really, I mean, it puts into a whole new perspective what's going on in our world. I think it makes me feel more excited to get outside and just keep my eyes up and looking around. I recently moved to a, a town that's kind of, it's near the Appalachian Mountains. Or the mountains that are I'm on are more like, I think they're called like the Berkshire Mountain Chain. But it's 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 connected to the Appalachian Mountains. But it's a totally different environment than what I was raised in. And uh, and I definitely am, am, am like excited for the weather to get warmer and to just sit on the mountain and look up and try to spot some some manta rays I, maybe. I think you'll see them i mean really i think that people more people see them than they realize because mm. uh, i think they kind of get lumped so there's a little bit of negative though with this uh i think they get lumped in with the normal ufo phenomenon whether whatever that is you know if you want to say it's aliens you want to say it's interdimensional you want to say it's our government i think it's yes whatever you want to call you know it's yes it's a bunch of different things that we're seeing in the upper atmosphere then every once in a while that there's these big jellies or the sky snakes or these big blanket squids up there. And people are like, well, I don't know what that was, but it was huge. And it was, you know, it was moving like it was alive. Uh, recently, there was a, bi- or not a biologist, a scientist came out and said that's all plasma we're seeing, this giant plasma discharge. And that's why it looks like it's alive. Personally, I don't think so. I think there's, you know, these massive organic animals up there. Uh, but when you're watching, like, uh, I think these guys get mistaken for the triangle phenomena because they have these bioluminescent areas on them. They can flash lights and they can, you know, create color. Uh, we, they look very similar to deep sea what, uh, cone jellies. Mm-hmm. And anybody hasn't done the labor to themselves of just looking up cone jelly videos. They don't look real. They don't look like they're an organic thing. They look like little gel robots that flash lights and synchronized patterns that you'd think it's a computer doing it. And it's animals talking to each other. And so I think that's what we're seeing some of these times. These uh, there was, We got a book coming out about this stuff. Hopefully this year is when the book will come out. I have two weekends to work on it next month. Um, about organic UFOs and the animals in the upper atmosphere. There's one famous account in Chile where these giant, what the, the witness called black triangles, but the best way he could describe them as black, he didn't see them as black, he just seen the lights. And they were see-through to the sky behind, which was black at night but they would collide with each other almost like they were rubbing up on each other. And if you ever watch videos of whales, they'll do this. They do this behavior, whether it's courtship or just comfort or just doing it to do it, you know? And I think these are the whales of the sky. And so he's literally describing, and there's videos of this encounter in Chile where these are, it may have been Argentina, it's South America, where these giant, I mean, these, you know, triangles that are bigger than Walmart, uh, are bumping into each other nose to nose and kind of just sliding over each other. 
And I think he encountered uh, a breeding area for these giant jellies, essentially. And this whole city seen them. I remember you, I played that video for you. Yeah. Well, during a thunderstorm, too, also. Another key fact with a lot of these guys that are witnessed is around thunderstorms, and like I told you why. And so it just seemed like there was, and there was three or four of these giant triangles, but there was these two that just kind of were bumping into each other a lot. Probably trying to make little baby triangles. Well, and it would make sense to see those sorts of...